Last time we met, we talked about composition of steels. And uh, I pointed out that uh, composition uh, of steel has a impact on the transformations in the steel um, and the way it does this is uh, well first of all whenever you have an alloying element you're going to change the free energy difference between the product phase and the parent phase so in this case the, for instance we're looking at the ferrite transformation or formation of ferrite out of austenite free energy of alpha and gamma and as these are composition temperature dependent uh, delta G will change on alloying you get effects that are due to partitioning I've told you for instance that when you transform austenite <coughs> to ferrite the solubility of the carbon is very low in ferrite so there is a transfer of carbon uh, between ferrite from the ferrite to the austenite that goes along with the um, the transformation from so that has an impact on the transformation and then you can have carbide formation Some, uh, uh, compounds we've seen will form very stable carbides others will uh, partition to the um, cementite as it forms. Today we're going to look at another aspect of uh, composition. How composition and structure um, are uh, related to the, the mechanical properties. And in particular uh, I have this slide here which shows, which says us, tells us something about the um, uh, the strength aspect of steels and I ended last lecture by saying that with steels a uh, commercially pure iron uh, will typically have so that's you know very pure iron this uh, has about 60 megapascal in tensile strength yeah it's very this is something very soft you you don't need to be a uh, you know, a strong person to bend this, this, uh, this type of, of material. But with the same material, with actually relatively little alloying uh, composition, alloying uh, changes, you can have three gigapascal. Yeah, three gigapascal. So that's 3,000 megapascals of strength. Yes, and, and that you will have difficulty, you know, bending. Um, so, um, and everything in between. You can make steels that every, everything in between uh, basically is not a problem. You know? So we have a wide variety of strengths, and that's one of the reasons why we use steel so, so, so widely. Okay? So what, when we talk about strengths uh, from a... Uh, in the right direction from the um, uh, point of view of microstructure what's what are we talking about strength what, what makes the strength of a material well uh, say if you are testing a material for instance a, a cylindrical specimen we've broken it we've measured the strength of this material um, uh, well the strength will depend on the microstructure for instance, this is a steel microstructure here um, we don't really see at this level of magnification what's going on, uh, what causes, what gives me the mechanical properties of the steel. I, will, I need to magnify this to the next level uh, of resolution. Pop this in a TM, for instance, and then I see this kind of uh, lattice defects, which we call dislocations. And we, dislocations are responsible for the plastic deformation of crystals in general and uh, as, as steel is a crystalline material um, 
we get dislocations which are responsible for plastic deformation. Hmm? And you know that a simple picture of a um, edge dislocation in a crystal is, for instance, uh, you have a slip plane here, and you see here there is an extra half plane of uh, atoms inserted here, and we call this a um, uh, edge dislocation. And as it moves through the crystal, you can propagate uh, deformation by uh, shear. Okay? So, um, and this is rather universal. Hmm? For instance, when um, you have, uh, for instance, this huge uh, forge, forging uh, device here, uh, you have this uh, shaft here that's being forged hmm? um, with this, this anvil here yeah? at high temperature. You can see that it's red hot. The way it plastically deformed is thanks to these dislocations in the microstructure yeah? that allow a very large amount of uh, plastic flow. So plastic deformation is due to the, uh, the, the, the presence of these, these defects, the dislocations. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and the same when you are doing a tensile test, you, know, you take a standardized specimen, you pull it in a tensile machine, and you measure uh, the mechanical properties. If you look into the microstructure, you will see plenty of dislocations which uh, have allowed, have made it possible by their motion through the little uh, uh, grains in the microstructure to give you plastic deformation. Hmm? So, all right. so, uh, from, so, so how does it work in principle? Hmm? So we look uh, for those just to remind you of what, what's going on here um, when we talk about dislocations. So, uh, so when you have deformation of your grains in the microstructure, we don't have, there is no homogeneous translation, right? There's no homogeneous shear. Yeah? Instead, what you have is dislocations that move on a slip plane, yes? And these dislocations are called line defects. I'll say in a moment uh, how this uh, occurs, why we call it a line defect. Hmm? And they cause slip hmm, between crystal planes as they move. Hmm? And because this slip is permanent, yes, we're looking at plastic deformation. Yeah? So for instance, let's look at this single crystal here. Yes, um, The way uh, it gets longer when we pull in the, uh, in the vertical direction here is conceptually mm, we think of this as you push in a set of lattice plane into the crystal, yes? So you, you push an uh, uh, extra half plane of uh, crystal atoms uh, into the top uh, crystal here and you let this extra half plane move through the crystal, hmm? move through the crystals, yes? And when it pops out on the other side, what has happened is, uh, well, the sample has become longer, yes? It's become longer when this extra half plane exits, and I've given the material a, a permanent elongation, so I've basically plastically deformed it. That's the, yeah. Now, the, this, when you move in this extra half plane, on, at, on this side of the crystal, nothing really changed. It's still the same crystal. Where the, uh, the dis lattice distortions are localized are here. Here you have lots of lattice distortions and shear deformations, yes? Yes, and because it's a line, yeah, it's a line, it's a, the, the bottom row of atoms of this extra half plane, we call it a line defect. Okay. So, so, so now let's look at, into more detail what's, what's happening at the core, yes, at the core of the 
uh, uh, the, this location, what you basically have is a very small rearrangement of the metallic bond at the core of the dislocation, yes? And this, which allows an elementary shear to move through the crystal. Hmm? So think of, that, think of it as, as such. You have, uh, this is, would be my extra half plane, yes? And when this extra half plane move, it actually doesn't physically move. It, we just rearrange the bonds locally. Hmm? So uh, this bond uh, goes here, makes a connection with this one, yes? And you end up having this, right? And although you can see not much has changed, um, it turns out that this, the, this extra half plane is now here, yes? And if this process of rearranging the bonds at the core of the dislocation here, yes, uh, goes through the crystal, you come out with a step, yes, on the left-hand side here. So, and you'll have basically plastic deformation. And if this happens with zillions and zillions of dislocations, you can have a real big macroscopic deformation. Yes. So, um, and a very nice way of thinking about it is, it, uh, is, is look at the parallel process in a similar process rather in biology is that a snake doesn't have a feet to walk over uh, ground. So what it does, it makes a kink at one in its body at one end, yes? And it lets this kink propagate through uh, its body, yes? When the kink arrives at its head, it's, it's moved up, yes? So it doesn't jump like this. It just lets it a little kick, yeah? So it basically makes a propagating kink, and that's a dislocation. So a very similar uh, thing happens in the crystal. Right. So, um, so my, my material, of course, this slip can happen on many crystal planes, and there can be many dislocations. And say if you have uh, these slip planes here, and you have many dislocations pass through it, you can see that uh, eventually I will get a permanent elongation of my crystal, and that is uh, plastic deformation. All right. Okay. So let's. Uh, right. So uh, these dislocations move rather easily in steels. Rather easily. Yeah. You don't need much force to to get them moving. Yes. So. What happens when you actually do a test? And this is a steel, for instance, very simple constructional steel, and you measure the stress-strain curve. This is what you see. You're all familiar with that. You get, you get an increase. Here it starts to flow plastically. There may be some, uh, uh, what we say, a yield point, but in general, you know, you see the strength of the material increases. So uh, what is happening here? What is happening is that something is preventing the dislocations to move. Gradually, yes, this, uh, something happens inside the microstructure that makes it harder and harder for the dislocation to move, yes? And strength, Yes, and that's what we call strength. Yes? The basic, the physics behind, the physical process behind it is simple. What we're, strength is, is nothing else than resistance to dislocation movement by obstacles, right? At this time, we don't say what obstacles are, but you can see at this picture here that um, there are rather, there, there are quite a lot of dislocations, right? So one of the things that happens is that dislocations get in the way of other dislocations, hmm? and they become obstacles to each other, right? Okay. So, um, and, and that's one of the ways in which we create um, hardening or strength, okay? So let's now have a 
revisit our snake, yes? And so what is the idea? Yeah. Similarity, strength is resistant to dislocation movement, yes? Well, it's the same as the snake. Say you drop a stone on his neck and the snake makes a kink and the kink stops at this stone, right? And the snake is stuck, yeah? So that's one of the things you can do to, uh, to prevent dislocations from moving is, you know, pin, pin them somehow, you know? like you pin down the uh, snake here. Or you, what you can uh, do is uh, you can put a, an obstacle in front of the dislocation, yes, so that uh, the king goes through the, uh, the, dis the, the snake here, but it cannot move ahead, yes? cannot push ahead. So strength is obstacle to dislocation movement. All right. Now there are, um, in a nutshell, again, this is not a course on mechanical metallurgy, but so let's, let's then quickly review how we increase strength in crystalline materials in general, and in particular in, for steels. Well, one of uh, one of the ways we uh, one of the ways we use to increase strength in steels is by alloying. So, and of course, that means composition does not only have influence on microstructure and uh, transformation, etc., carbide formation, but also on strength. So, we, by by alloying, we can have a, what we call solid solution hardening, yes, and uh, increase the strength this way. What we basically do is uh, the presence of the atoms in the lattice, yes, will interact with, uh, with the dislocations, basically, and hold them up, yes, work as obstacles. And there, I want you to remember three elements in particular that have a very strong hardening effect, and those are phosphorus, silicon, and manganese. What does that mean? Hmm? It means that as I increase the solute content of these elements, I see an increase in the strength, for instance here, the yield strength. Hmm? And phosphorus um, is an element that has a tremendous uh, strengthening effect. The reported values are 500 to 1250 megapascals per percent of phosphorus. So that means, say you have, you remember this 60 megapascal of iron, yes? So if you add, say, half a percent of phosphorus to this, the strength goes to uh, 250 plus 60, so over 300 megapascal. So that is a five-fold increase in the strength. So it's a very big uh, impact, right? Silicon is the next big strengthener. It's, uh, it's 80 to 100 megapascal hmm, per percent of silicon. Manganese, 30 to 80 are reported values uh, per percent. The relation between the increase in strength and the, uh, the, the solute content is actually very difficult to compute theoretically. So even today, we don't really know if there is an exponent here, how much that exponent is. And technologically, we kind of assume it's one. Yes, there are theories that support this view, there are theories that do not support this view, and there are elements that don't behave uh, according to theory. <coughs> but, okay. so, but technologically, we don't use, in, in steel certainly, we don't use very, very high uh, uh, contents, alloying contents. So this linear approach is not that bad. Right, uh, remember these elements are uh, all 
substitutional elements, carbon, nitrogen uh, are interstitial elements. They have a very strong uh, strengthening effect too, but you cannot dissolve much carbon in ferrite, right? So, um, whereas you can dissolve quite a lot of manganese in, 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 in silicon in, in ferrite. The other method to increase uh, strength is simply using uh, deformation. It's called strain hardening. Yes, strain hardening. So if you increase the dislocation density, as I said, the dislocations run into each other. They, they form their own obstacles. There are th their own obstacles. And here we, we know that there is a relation between the strength and the dislocation density, and it goes according to the square root of the dislocation density. Hmm? Um, another method that's probably well known to you um, from your undergraduate courses in uh, material science, you can increase the yield strength by reducing the grain size. Yes? Uh, steel is a polycrystalline material uh, and grain uh, boundaries are ideal obstacles because there is no continuity in the slip uh, across the grain boundary. So it's a very strong obstacle. Yeah? And indeed you find that um, as you um, reduce the grain size, you have a very strong increase in the yield strength yeah? And it's usually presented uh, using the uh, whole patch equation, yes? uh, which uh, tells you that the strength is proportional to uh, the reciprocal of the square root of the uh, grain size, grain diameter. So that means if I have 1 over the square root uh, in of the uh, grain size in the as the x-axis, hmm? the grain size is large on this side, so this is large grains, and on this side we have small grains, and small grains give me very high strength. Yeah? So, steel makers love small grain sizes, right? Because you don't have to add anything, yes? And it's, it's a very cost-effective way to get strength, right? Um, finally, um, you remember I showed you this picture where you had the, uh, the snake had the stone in front of its nose and couldn't get beyond that stone, right? Well, that's nothing else than it's a um, cartoon way of talking about precipitation hardening. So in precipitation hardening, your yield strength is a function of the diameter particle. The diameter particle, the diameter of the precipitates. So if I have a single crystal and I have my dislocations move on the slip planes, yes, um, if I make precipitates, for instance, carbides, yes, in this microstructure, I basically have obstacles, create obstacles uh, that the dislocations cannot cross, yes? And uh, in general, um, we have this inverted T symbol to represent dislocation. So this, what I'm, I'm showing here are this location that run into these obstacles. Okay, so the smaller the diameter is of these uh, particles, the stronger the effect is for a certain constant volume fraction. And the more, the higher volume fraction I have, the higher the, uh, the effect is on the yield strength. Okay. Just so uh, at this stage already you have some uh, feeling for numbers again, 
volume fractions don't, don't have to be very high. For instance, a volume fraction of 10 to the minus 3, it's a small volume fraction, yes, uh, and a particle diameter of 5 nanometers, that's 50 angstroms. Hmm? Um, remember that the lattice parameter of, uh, of uh, alpha or gamma iron is of the order of 3, 0.3 nanometer, then 5 nanometers yeah, uh, means that the particles are about 10 times a unit cell of iron. So these are small particles. Yeah? So uh, they have a, a very pronounced effect. Yes? You don't need to have huge particles. Okay. So how do we achieve this? Uh, how do we uh, uh, work this out in practice? Well, obviously, solute uh, atom content to give me uh, um, solid solution hardening. That's done by alloying, obviously. The control of the grain size and precipitation hardening is done partially by the alloying and also by processing. Yes, that's the way you control uh, precipitation hardening and grain size. This location density control is basically done by deformation. Yes. And um, I want to say a few things about this. There are very, f it's not very common to use uh, strained material to, to get strength properties. Yes? Usually what steel makers do, they make something, yes, that's uh, fully recrystallized, yes, that has, that has a certain formability, yes, and they don't strain it to get specific mechanical properties, to get strength. Why don't they do this? Because when you deform something, it becomes stronger. That's right. But you, you have reduced the residual capacity for forming, right? If you, if you go, you deform something 10%, and it breaks at 20%, it means you, only, you, know, you can only deform it an additional 10%, right? So, um, so it's, but there are products where we do this, yes? Um, for instance, you're probably all uh, familiar with corrugated steel, corrugated steel where they make roofs. You're all looking at me as if, This is corrugated steel. You get it? Yeah. This is actually made with relatively uh, cheap material. Yes. Uh, and uh, but it's very strong. I mean, you should try to bend it. Or it's kind of strong. The reason is it's because it's cold rolled. It's it's heavily deformed. So it's very strong. Yeah. So it's strain hardened. Yeah? But you wouldn't make a car this way, right? Um, there are other products, for instance, certain um, uh, rebars that you use for, uh, for to make buildings, uh, cement buildings. They will have, uh, you will increase their strength by uh, torsion deformation. So there are some applications where you can adjust the strength, yield strength levels for, um, uh, by, by doing strain hard. But in general, you know, uh, it's, it's usually done for um, very commercial grades uh, uh, where the demands are relatively minor. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, these mechanical properties in more detail. Um, so you test the steel, you'll get a yield strength you'll get your, your hardening here. And then, at, certainly if you measure engineering stress versus engineering strain, you, this, this stress that your machine measure peaks and then 
uh, uh, reduces gradually and then drops very quickly. Hmm? And then the material breaks. So when you reach this maximum, yes, uh, that's when the moment where you uh, develop a diffuse neck in the material at certain place. And then uh, the cracking, the fracture, uh, happens uh, so right before the fracture happens, you develop a local neck. A local neck. The deformation of your material is homogeneous only here, up to here. Yeah? After that, as soon as you develop a diffuse neck, all the deformation is in this region. Right? Okay? And when you form a local neck, like this one here, all the deformation is in this local neck. Yes? Right? So that's why do not be fooled by very high total elongations. Yes? It's very often, in many applications, the uniform elongation is most important. Yes? And in many uh, steel grades, in particular very soft steel grades, the uniform elongation can be half the post-uniform or non-uniform elongation. So that means, take for instance, there are these uh, steel grades, which we call interstitial free grades. They're very formable. They're very popular to make uh, hard to press uh, parts. Uh, they have, people will tell you, they have elongations of 40%. But only 20% of this deformation is actually uniform. If you go beyond 20%, the material develops a very big diffuse neck, and it takes a long time before it, it actually breaks. But in terms of uniform deformation, you only have 20%. Right, so, so you deform the material in, uh, in this test here in, in the lengthwise. Um, by the way, you, you can actually, I, I think maybe, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So as you deform the material in, in the length wise, it becomes longer in one direction. And you know that one characteristic of plastic deformation is that the volume does not change. There's no volume change. Yeah? So that means that, well, something, if the material gets longer in this direction, it must get slimmer in the in this, the cross section must get narrower yeah? and so you have in this particular case you can have a width strain the sample can get narrower and the can also get thinner right now which one is more dangerous well say it strains very quickly in the thickness direction then it's going to break quickly because it becomes thinner, right? But say it doesn't strain in the thickness direction, it strains in the width direction. Then you can have the material, um, the deformation is safer. You can strain it more before it, it starts to uh, constrict and break. So um, an important parameter, for instance, in, in sheet material is not only strength, but also the way strain is distributed. Yeah? And in particular, for instance, um, the thickness strain is very important. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you make this, uh, this is an uh, oil pan for a car. And uh, it's what we call, it's called, it's deep drawn, yes, uh, part. It's made from sheet material. And uh, so you don't want much thickness loss during this process, because otherwise it will uh, fracture. So you want to have the thickness. So, so if, if, if you look at the part like this, or rather, let's, let's look at our uh, strain sample here. So as you ch strain the material in the length, there will be a reduction of the, the thickness. So you have a thickness strain, which is negative. Yes. And um, 
I can have these different lines, yes? depending on, so in this case, the um, dashed curve here, the thickness strain, this thickness reduction is not very, is less important than in this case, yes? What, what happens is the volume needs to be uh, kept, so um, it depends on what happens to the width strain. Hmm? So if I have a lot of width strain, I will have little thickness strain, and vice versa, if I have a lot of width strain, less width strain, excuse me, I will have a lot of thickness strain. So we use a factor called the R factor, which is the ratio of the width strain, the width strain, so in this direction, in the horizontal direction, yeah, over the thickness strain, which is the change in this direction, in the thickness of this circle. So what do I want? Yes, for instance, in, in many uh, sheet uh, materials, uh, I want to have a very high R value. Very high R value, which means that the thickness strain is very small. And this allows me to do difficult uh, press forming operations. Okay. Grain size uh, is a important parameter. I already said this is the well-known Holpatch uh, uh, equation. Hmm? You can see here. This is a technique that some of you. Uh, may be familiar with through your work or will very likely be familiar, become familiar with is EBSD. It allows you to see the differences in crystallographic orientation. So you see the grains here, different orientations. And what we want to do is get this, the grain size as small as possible. Um, the um, grain size is a uh, as I said, important parameter because of this strength impact, yes? And um, you have to be aware of the fact that in the steel industry, uh, there is a, uh, a long-standing way uh, or procedure to uh, define the grain size. And it's a little bit odd because it's uh, historic and uh, some people are um, sometimes wondering how, how it works. But what you basically, um, and, and the technique comes from uh, the fact that in early days you would do everything by optical metallography. Hmm? Standard optical metallography. So, w but basically what you have is you define the grain size not as grain diameter, right? From a scientific point of view, like when you will you publish your research, you want to have the grain diameter, yes? The, um, the grain size, in technical terms, is, is more defined like the density of grains, yes? And that's why you get some very interesting confusion is that so if you have uh, so grain density versus grain size if you have a very high say let's say you have a small uh, a low density of grains and a high density of grains within a certain field of view, yeah, in a microscope. So this would be D1 uh, and this is D2. Yeah. So D1 is larger than D2. A grain density measurement, yes, is low when the grain size is large, yes? And so you see that it, you know, small grain size means large densities of grains, right? So it goes reverse. 
And that is one of the reasons why there is this ASTM grain size number, which is very commonly used in the, in the steel industry, which is not a measure of grain size, but a measure of grain density, yes? So when you plot the grain diameter and you compare it with what's called the ASTM number, yes, you see that large grain diameters correspond to low ASTM numbers and small grain sizes correspond to large ASTM numbers, okay? The connection, uh, of course, you, you know, it doesn't matter which way you look at the, the, the thing, um, but the connection between the two is shown here. Uh, what, what you basically look at is a field of view of 250 by 250 microns, yes? So, uh, and say you have uh, one grain in here, yes? then it necessarily has a diameter of 250. Yeah? So uh, that's this diameter. You can uh, determine what uh, the square is. You can determine what is the density of grains yes, on, in this surface. Yes? Of course, that's one, right? And the ASTM number is then, you use this formula to make the connection between uh, the, dense, the grain diameter and the ASTM number is one. Hmm? Alternatively, you can say, well, I only have uh, a, say, 11 micron grain size, then this is the grain, yes? And how, and you, how many do I have of, of these grains in, on this surface? Well, I can get uh, 512 grains, yes? And if you calculate this, this gives you a 10. The ASTM number and the grain size in microns are approximately the same for 10 microns. So when you hear grain ASTM number of 10 and 10 micron, that's the only time when they're about the same. Otherwise, they go in different directions, right? So, um, and um, well, so technologically, um, our grain sizes for uh, ferritic low carbon steels are of the order are between 10 and 20 microns. So the ASTM numbers you see are are going to be in that range, eight, nine, ten. That's kind of so. Please remember that certainly if in the future you ever work in a factory. So uh, we, I had said uh, we control the grain size by processing. Yes, we control the grain size by processing. Uh, when you take a material with a certain grain size and you deform it at room temperature, you get the same grain size before and after. The only difference you get is that after the deformation you have deformed grains, but they're the same size. They haven't changed their size. So, Grain size control always evol involves thermal treatments. You need to get the grains to, the grain boundaries to change, yes? You, get, you need to get what we call recrystallizations, yes? Um, and you need to control grain growth, right? So, the, the idea is very simple. You, you have a grain. You squash it by you know, mechanical deformation, right? So it's full of, guess what, dislocations because you plastically deformed it. And that uh, will drive recrystallization at high temperature. Yeah? And the recrystallization can, gives you uh, many uh, grains, new grains with new orientations and no dislocations. Yeah? And it's by controlling this process of recrystallization that you get 
your grain stocks. So let's look at a particular process, rolling, yes, hot rolling. You, uh, you start with a particular grain size, and then you go through rolling uh, stands. So when you, you, you look at one single grain, this grain gets squashed during the deformation. And we call this process pancaking. We pancake the grains. Um, during, in the roll gap here, during deformation, there can already be recrystallization. Certainly if the deformation is really high, you get what's called dynamic recrystallization. After the deformation, I get static recrystallization. That means the grain start, new, new dislocation-free grains start to, uh, to grow in this deformed microstructure. They will limit will recrystallize, yes? Once, and this is a very dynamic process, once the grains recrystallize, they compete for space, yes? And some grains will grow at the expense of other grains, yes? Of smaller grains, yeah? So we get, between the deformation steps, you get static recrystallization and then grain growth, yeah? And then you can have more deformation steps. Yeah? But what happens in these sequences of deformation and recrystallization and deformation and recrystallization, you will gradually reduce the grain size, yes? The, uh, and we've seen that uh, already earlier, that one of the ways, one of the problems uh, that we have is that we have this very high rate of recrystallization at uh, high temperatures. So we add elements such as um, niobium and other microalloying additions to suppress recrystallization. So we can make very, uh, uh, get recrystallization in a very highly deformed material. Recrystallization or transformation. And the example I just showed you and, and had shown you earlier was an example of transformation. So this is a typical uh, process diagram for hot forming. You will see this uh, more than once in the course of our lectures, certainly when we talk about um, hot roll products. Um, what happens in general? Well, uh, you have the temperature here and here you have time, yes? And uh, these wiggles here are the symbol for deformations. So um, typically, I've said this earlier, when you process steels, many steel, most steels, the high temperature part of the uh, processing happens in the fully austenitic range. Not always, but most of the time. So you deform the material, it cools as you process the material, and you get a recrystallization of gamma as you deform it. So you get a finer grain that you had originally. Hmm? Then you go through a region, a, a very narrow region, uh, where the recrystallization is suppressed. Yes, it's suppressed because the temperatures are very low. Yes, um, and you can't technically you cannot, this material, by the way, is uh, uh, this uh, thermal mechanical processing that I'm showing here is for a steel that does not contain, not, not contain niobium, right? This region of non-recrystallization, yes, is very, very narrow, yes? And you cannot exploit this region in practice because it's too close to the transformation temperature. And it's not healthy in general to process two-phase materials or process a steel when it's transforming mm -hmm. uh, because that gives you instabilities. Yeah? There is a very a different strength properties in the two phases. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you, you pass through this region and then you, on cooling, you do the transformation and the uh, uh, ferrite grains form from recrystallized Austin. 
All right. Now, with the addition of niobium, and we always add a slightly higher uh, manganese also in these uh, grades, but that's, that's uh, a little bit of a detail. This region of non-recrystallization is expanded, yes? It's expanded. And so the temperature of non-recrystallization yes, is uh, increased. So that means that we are now able to deform material, our material at high temperature, but in a zone where the austenite does not recrystallize, yes? And when that happens, I get ferrite is nucleated, yes, inside deformed austenite, and that gives me a tremendous reduction in the, uh, the grain size, yes? This is achieved with relatively minor additions of this element niobium, and minor extra additions of, of manganese. And, and I've given you some numbers already. You know that that's about 400 ppm. Okay. So the process is complex. So you need to control the, the, the process. And I've already uh, told you that it was, what happens is an interplay between recrystallization and precipitation. That's why uh, you, you get this suppression of recrystallization. So let's have a look at the recrystallization, kinetics. Um, okay, let's think of a, uh, I'm, I'm deforming this austenite yeah? and I'm clocking the, the time it takes to recrystallize, yes? Or start recrystallization. And I'm going to do this as a function of the, uh, the temperature. So I'm look, I deform it, material, I bring it at a certain temperature, and I clock how much time it takes uh, the material to start recrystallizing. At high temperature, this goes very fast. Yeah? It goes very fast. For instance, this much time. At lower temperature, say this, it takes a little bit longer. Yes? And the more I reduce the temperature, the longer it takes for the material to recrystallize. So this is the start of the recrystallization. Yeah? And I, I can just follow the recrystallization with time, and I can also make a plot for the, f the time start and finish, right? For the finish of the recrystallization. So, uh, so the recrystallization kinetics are usually shown as time, uh, excuse me, uh, temperature here, time here, yeah? And you get more or less straight lines if you plot it, if you plot a logarithm of the time. Hmm? So uh, say, for instance, a steel, will take, at 900 degrees C, will take less than a second to start uh, transforming, uh, uh, recrystallization, recrystallization, excuse me. And uh, if it's at 950, yes, uh, you can see it takes me about one second to recrystallize fully, yes? So you're doing, uh, you saw, for instance, this uh, shaft being forged, yes? When between the, the forging passes, the material recrystallizes fully, right? Because it takes much more than a second to, uh, to apply these, uh, the, the, the deformation, yeah? Let's look at the precipitation now. Let's look at the precipitation. Now, uh, and in particular, we, in the case of niobium, we need to look at the niobium carbide precipitation. So you know that, uh, again, from your introductions to uh, uh, material science, is that 
whenever you form something in a solid, hmm, uh, for instance, niobium carbide, hmm, what has to happen? Well, first you need to nucleate thing, yeah? So first you need, you have a nucleation stage, nucleation. And what's the other thing you need? You need growth, right? You need, and, and growth means you have, you know, th this particle cannot grow if you don't have niobium and carbon moving towards it, right? So they need to diffuse to the particle, or it's not gonna grow, right? Uh, so the growth is very much a function of the diffusivity, yeah, diffusivity of of niobium and carbon in this case. Now, carbon is an interstitial, so it diffuses very quickly, right? So that's not an issue. Niobium is, is substitutional, it's, it has a much lower diffusivity, so it's the diffusion of niobium that will control the growth of the particle. Right? The nucleation, nucleation, well, do you need a lot of diffusion for nucleation? For nucleation, you mainly need driving force. Yes, you need to have driving force. So, so niobium plus carbon goes to niobium carbide. So I need to have. Uh, first of all, I need I need this value to be negative. So I need to be below solubility. So if I have a temp temperature here and here, time to precipitate. This is the solubility temperature. Nothing happens at temperatures higher than the solubility temperature because there's no driving force, right? It has to remain in solution. And then the kinetics, if I draw the kinetics of the, trans of the precipitation, I usually find a C curve. The reason being that when I'm very close to the solubility line, I don't have much driving force, yeah? and if I'm very much below the solubility line, I get lots of driving force, because the solubility is strongly reduced, yes? But I have low diffusivity for niobium, yes? So again, it takes longer to precipitate. And if I go low enough, 550, that's typically, remember, that's the temperature I told you, remember 550, because that's the temperature below which substitutional atoms do not diffuse anymore. Um, well, you can just basically suppress the precipitation, and it doesn't matter. The driving force may be huge. You don't have any uh, uh, diffusion of niobium, so there will not be any growth, and, and you will not have any uh, So there is a C curve. Yeah, C curve, and, um, and, and this C curve, uh, well, you know, in, in, in theory, we, you know, it always you know, looks like a C curve, and in practice, when you start doing research, um, curve for niobium carbide looks a little bit like this. So it means that, for instance, at 1,000 degrees, it takes about um, a second to uh, precipitate, uh, to start precipitating, um, 900, uh, excuse me, um, not uh, second hours. Uh, so, so this is not an error. This is, so, so it takes a thousand degrees, yes. Is that the fastest it goes, yes, is of the order of slightly less than an hour, yes. It takes, it takes very long time for niobium carbide to precipitate, yes. However, if the uh, matrix is deformed, strained, it's, it's very different. The precipitation is accelerated. So now, if you look at the red curve, they're now here. This is now the precipitate, precipitation kinetics of the niobium, <coughs> and you can see it now takes a mere seconds to uh, precipitate. And this, as a consequence, these recrystallization curves, yes, are changed to, 
and they are slowed down. Yeah? So now instead of having uh, less than a second for full recrystallization, I have few tenths of a second. This diagram also tells you that uh, the recrystallization is not stopped. The recrystallization is slowed down. But it's slowed down enough so that you can accumulate deformation without recrystallization, right? So, um, so this is an example here. Uh, for instance, in hot rolling, you see this is the temperature that the strip goes through, and, um, and this is the grain size. So first, let's look at the red grain size. You have a very large grain size to start with. This, these reductions are from roughing passes, rough uh, deformation of the, uh, the material. And then here, you, you can see the reduction of the grain size every time you deform the material. So here it, you get a strong reduction, and then you get grain growth between the deformation passes. Yes? If we have niobium, you reduce the grain size. There is no recrystallization or minimal recrystallization between the passes. Yes? And so eventually, uh, your grain size is much reduced. And when you do the transformation, yeah, uh, you get a, a grain size that's typically below 10 microns. In this case, the grain size will be of the order of 20 microns. But because the strengthening uh, that we get from Hall patch effect is so pronounced, even this this reduction of 20 to 7 or 8 microns yeah, is very uh, important. So uh, when it comes to uh, grain size control, uh, most of the time we, um, we use uh, niobium. There are alternatives, uh, which are shown here, vanadium and titanium. And you see the precipitates uh, uh, that, uh, that you see. So what, what's important here is that, um, and I want to, it's, it's important because many people think, um, you know, uh, some people in the industry also think, oh, you know, if I, I can, you can replace uh, niobium with titanium or with vanadium, you, got, you get the same effect. It's, it's uh, only true to, to a very limited extent. Uh, one of the things you see here uh, are the, um, the stability uh, of the precipitates. Yes? So uh, you see here that, for instance, titanium <coughs> yeah, forms an extremely stable so very, very uh, negative delta G, extremely stable nitride. Uh, this uh, means that uh, it will uh, very readily precipitate, and it, that's, it, it uh, does this. And I've told you already that that's one of the reasons why uh, we add titanium to get rid of free nitrogen in our steels. Uh, the other precipitates are formed in the solid phase. Uh, titanium carbide, vanadium nitride, and uh, the ni nitrides and carbides of niobium. And you have a, excuse me, a precipitate here, vanadium carbide, which has a very small delta G. Yes? So its delta G is so small that actually yes, it does not form in austenite. It forms during the transformation and after the transformation in the ferrite only. Yes? And um, 
Right, I see it's uh, time. So I will continue uh, this uh, on Monday rather than uh, start something new. Um, by the way, tomorrow afternoon, uh, I think most of you are uh, GFD students, but there may be some post-tech material science students, right? So tomorrow afternoon, I'm giving a, a, a GFD seminar on strain hardening in steels. You may want to, certainly if you're in material science, uh, come and have listen. It's a little bit advanced topic on strain hardening in steels, and it, it might be interesting to in relation to what we're dealing with uh, today and, uh, and next Monday. Perhaps interesting for you to come and, uh, and listen. Okay, thank you very much.